So we'll follow on the light topic of uh, the last panel about nuclear war in South Asia with um, a panel about yet another insignificant part of the world. Um, we're going to look at, um, at whether a long peace is possible in Asia and more specifically how China sees itself in the world and, uh, and the future of war in the region. Um, so happily, we've already spoken about this in uh, a few of the last panels, even the question of whether there could be World War III um, begun uh, through a conflict between the U.S. and China. Uh, but to help us think through these issues, um, we have a great panel with um, people who have uh, a few different um, areas of expertise. So Dr. Oriana Mastro at the end there is a professor of security studies at Georgetown University, and she focuses on the Chinese military uh, and security policy. She's also in the Air Force Reserve, so she's promised to use military precision in keeping us all on time. Um, Dr. Sheldon Simon is a professor and director of um, ASU's Center for Asian Studies, and he focuses on China's influence in Southeast Asia. So he'll be giving us a great overview of what's happening in the South China Sea and uh, China's version of the Monroe Doctrine, as we discussed last night. And lastly, my old friend Philippe Lacour, whom I met while on a Fulbright in Hong Kong uh, 15 or so years ago, um, who's a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution, um, focusing on China's foreign policy, um, especially as it pertains to Europe, and has a new book coming out uh, dealing with China's investment in Europe. Um, so with that, can, Oriana, can you start us off with a bit of an overview? me today. I do only have four minutes, and so I'm going to cut right to the chase. The question of this panel is, oh, do I, we have some, do we have some mic issues? No one can hear me? Nobody? Is there someone that can come up here and help me with the mic issues? I turned or do it you on. just want me to no, it's good. shout? Okay. Um, I'm just going to continue on with the bottom line up front of how we can answer this question of is a long peace possible in Asia? The short answer is, if you define a long peace, thank you, better. Does this work now? Yes, better. If you define a long peace as the absence of armed conflict or the use of military force to accomplish political and economic goals, I think the answer is no. More likely, what we're going to see in Asia is limited conflicts um, in the coming decades, and these conflicts are largely going to be associated with the rise of China. A brief caveat, however, China does not have global intentions. I think Chinese uh, objectives are extremely limited, what they say they want in terms of the territorial claims. I don't think that will change. Um, and though I've recently written a piece on, at the National Interest on the future of a global Chinese military, that piece was largely designed as a thought piece of what would happen that would force the Chinese against current plans to have a more global presence, which is currently not in the cards. But as China rises in power, it's going to expect and want other countries to accommodate its newfound position. It's going to want to translate its new power into politi achieving political and economic goals. China wants to be the dominant power in the Asia Pacific. The ideal system from the perspective of Beijing is an Asia that is multipolar in which China is one of the poles, and actually, ideally, one of the dominant poles. What this means is a decreased influence and role for the United States. These competing visions of the United States that is determined to stay in Asia, and China that would like the United States to militarily disengage from the region, is why we have increased competition and tension in the relationship. Now, of course, there are areas of mutual interest and opportunities for cooperation. But the bottom line is that in recent Chinese writings, they've shifted their perspective from the role of the United States as being a positive stabilizing factor to one in which the United States is the primary obstacle to their rise. Because of this, the United States is the chief actor in Chinese war planning when they think of the future of war. Uh, the Chinese think of sort of three types of conflict, all US-centric. First, they write about how the primary threat of war arises from US potential disruptive policies. Second, they think about how the threat is going to come from US sea power. And third, that the primary source of conflict is basically the United States refusing to decline gracefully, but instead doubling down in the form of the rebalancing to maintain its position. So the trends are not good. 
Xi Jinping has more recently domestically, the, the primary leader of China, has launched a domestic campaign, a war against Western influence in Chinese education. These are not good signs in which he wants to eliminate the role of the West in the history, politics, law, and other areas. Xi Jinping is a nationalist. He's not just using nationalism as a tool to rally his people. So in this context, again, I think that conflict is likely, but on a very limited scale. I think as many of us in the West, we think about war, we think about World War I, World War II, but really we're thinking more of these 30-day conflicts that we've seen in Asia, which a handful of people are killed that aren't at the grand scale that we're thinking about. So for military planners, the big question is not whether or not there's going to be a conflict in Asia, but instead, how are the Chinese going to perform? This is the huge uncertainty. The Chinese have focused lately on soft modernization. Um, they have for decades been building platforms and focusing on certain weapon systems to design, but now they have the hard part. They have huge weaknesses associated with their personnel's ability to actually conduct operations. We can talk more in the Q&A about the army dominance and how that hurts joint operations, shared command responsibility, inexperienced commanders and staff, and basically, no one in the Chinese military, very few have any combat experience since the last war they fight was 1979. So this is Xi Jinping's legacy. He wants soft modernization in terms of institutional organizational reform that allows them to achieve their goals if they need to through force. Corruption is a big part of this in which he'd like to enhance morale within the military and a meritocracy so that the people actually believe those who are commanding them are worthy of that position and hopefully in a conflict will actually listen to the commands issued down to them. So this is a very stark view about if, is the long peace possible? I don't think so. Um, but I don't think it looks as bad as we think it will either. And the big uncertainty on both sides that imposes caution on the Chinese is how they will perform. And if there is a limited, shorter conflict in which the Chinese gain that operational experience that they need to have confidence, that's when we need to be more concerned. Thanks so much, Ariana. Sheldon, if you would take us to one particular touchstone. Um, sure. Does my mic work? I guess it does. I, it does. So you don't need to pass that on to you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to pick up on some of the themes that Oriana presented and focus them on the South China Sea. I think that China does indeed have a grand strategy. Many China analysts don't, but I think it does. And I want to look at the South China Sea as an example of that grand strategy. What China's doing, in my mind, is striving for an exclusive sphere of influence in its neighborhood, a restoration, if you will, of the traditional Middle Kingdom dominance, or put another way, a Chinese Monroe Doctrine. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not even going to happen in a few years. But 10 to 20 years from now, I think Chinese leaders envision a situation in which the East and South China Seas will be dominated by the People's Republic of China. Let's look at the South China Sea. It's a main theater for this effort, in my view. It is a semi-enclosed body of water that straddles key shipping lanes from Southeast Asia to Northeast Asia. The Southeast Asian countries around the South China Sea are small and medium-sized countries. They don't have the material capability to resist China's supremacy. Unlike in Northeast Asia, the US security presence in the South China Sea is smaller, and American security commitments in Southeast Asia are seen as less robust than in Northeast Asia. China's legal claim to the South China Sea is its so-called nine-dash line, or cow's tongue, depending on which simile you want to use. It encompasses about 80% of the South China Sea. The initial evidence for implementation of the nine-dash line was, this, was the discovery of China's occupation of Mischief Reef off the Philippines, Palawan Island, in 1995. Nevertheless, it was more than a decade later that China possessed the maritime capabilities to begin to exclude the boats of Southeast Asian states from this region, particularly the, the boats of the Philippines and Vietnam. In China's grand strategy, its maritime dominance of the South China Sea is part of its ability to dominate what China refers to as the first island chain that stretches from Japan's Ryukyu Islands all the way down to the Philippines. Control of that stretch of ocean 
is seen as essential for China to implement its anti-access area denial strategy vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Returning to its South China Sea claims, China's nine-dash line, or cow's tongue, encompasses the bulk of the South China Sea waters, is based on the concept that control of those waters determines who owns the land features within the South China Sea. That concept is a true puzzle to those countries that have signed and ratified the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. That convention, according to over 90% of the signatories, states the opposite, that land determines water, water, or, uh, that, yeah, land determines water, not the other way around. So the exclusive economic zones and so on are determined by land. China's claim is that that's irrelevant. China owns the sea, therefore it controls the sea. China is now building structures, some of the speakers yesterday talked about it, on the islands it controls, particularly in the Paracels and Spratleys, which are contested by both Vietnam and the Philippines. China is enforcing its claim, and I think this is particularly interesting given that its claim that these are its national territories. It's enforcing its claim primarily with its Coast Guard and Maritime Authority boats, not with its Navy. Its Navy kind of lingers behind. So by using the Coast Guard and the Fishery Authority boats, in effect, China is demonstrating that these are China's national waters. It's not an international conflict. As China builds airstrips on some of the islands, it will be able, in due course, to run air patrols over disputed areas more often, providing air and naval coverage of the domain that it claims. Going back to China's nine-dash line, it overlaps the exclusive economic zones of Vietnam, the Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia, and probably the continental shelf of Indonesia. China's Coast Guard vessels already outnumber all of the Coast Guard vessels of all of the Southeast Asian claimants put together. And China is building a whole new array of Coast Guard vessels of 12,000 tons, which will be the largest Coast Guard vessels in the world when they're completed. So how does one sum this up? Although Vietnam and the Philippines have tried to use multilateral diplomacy in the region to rein in the PRC, this has so far been unsuccessful. Both Manila and Hanoi regularly raise China's actions in the South China Sea in meetings chaired and dominated by the Association of Southeast Asians, Southeast Asian nations. Basically, China simply ignores that. China has talked with ASEAN for years about creating a code of conduct, but China is uninterested, in fact, in concluding a code of conduct. It constantly stonewalls. China believes that the United States will not become involved in these Southeast Asian disputes, even when the Coast Guards of the literal countries conflict with the PRC. And I think China is probably right. So China's maritime impunity, in my view, will continue and increase. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Philippe, can you give us your view on China's yes, foreign policy? Yes, thank you, Bay. Uh, shall I give this one? Yes. Is it working? Um, well, I'm sorry about my voice. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's recovering. But um, I'm, I'm basically um, um, in agreement with my, my um, my colleagues, um, except for the fact I, I do believe um, the, um, China does have a, a global strategy. Um, and uh, the global strategy is about um, uh, economic, um, uh, more economic power for China. And um, my, the focus of my work for the past uh, year has been on investment, Chinese investments abroad. And I find it really, uh, striking that um, uh, a lot of infrastructures in particular have been taken over um, by, by Chinese companies, or at least there have been um, investments. Um, if you look at, at a number of European countries, for example, uh, Portugal, uh, Greece, um, Italy, 
and even, even bigger countries, you see a move um, from uh, China, both um, um, state-owned enterprises and private companies, uh, to invest in, in the energy sector. Now, this is taking us quite far away from the, from, um, the future of war, perhaps, but I do believe China, uh, and that, I'm sure that's of interest to a number of you in this room, um, has, has a plan which is um, to become uh, involved in, in the global economy. If you look at uh, Africa, if you look at uh, Latin America, um, uh, Australia, all these regions have seen for the past 15 years um, uh, uh, huge investments from China and in sectors that are uh, usually um, uh, energy, transport, as I said, um, utilities, and, um, and um, real estate, of course, which is a traditional um, uh, sector for the Chinese. Now, how does it work? Um, of course, there's no, uh, no such thing as a, a, a fully private investment in China. Um, the banks are state-owned. Um, uh, we are in a, at a stage in China where uh, the anti-corruption inter drive is so strong that for an official to travel abroad and, uh, or for a, the head of a company to travel abroad and um, discuss with a, a potential partner um, is very complicated if you, if you don't get an approval from the center. So indeed, uh, there is a strategy. That strategy is called China Green Global, and it's being accompanied by um, a number of uh, public diplomacy tools, you can call that, um, including uh, um, some kind of uh, soft, soft power engines, uh, the Confucius Institutes and things like that. But um, uh, at the end of the day, uh, what matters is that um, uh, the um, Chinese overseas investments are now uh, larger than FDIs uh, coming into China. And uh, China has four trillion dollars of foreign reserves. It, it is immensely uh, rich and powerful. And uh, they've decided to, to, to conquer the world in that way. At least, you know, in Europe, once again, uh, they've been taking advantage of the debt crisis. And um, it, we're going to see more of it. That's, that's what I would like to say. Thank you so much. Um, Oriana, I wanted to draw you out a little bit about, uh, you mentioned um, Xi Jinping's war against Western influence in education and his nationalist tendencies in general. Um, many have described that as Maoist, but of course right now he's functioning in um, a, a landscape in China that is uh, completely different from, um, from what it was in Mao's time. Um, people across China have unprecedented access to information, even with uh, China's Great Firewall, they um, are able to, to get around that with a fair amount of ease. Um, and, uh, and they can share information in a way that was never possible before. So I'm wondering what you think public opinion in China, um, how that has influenced Beijing's grand strategy or its foreign policy um, uh, interests? So I think um, what is useful for people who don't spend all day reading about China is to think about good comparisons. Now maybe our first panel on history would um, warn against this. But in many cases we look through history and we talk about nationalism and, and leaders and people compare China, you know, World War I, World War II. But I actually think the most relevant comparison is to the United States and the rise of the United States. Xi Jinping is a nationalist, and I don't mean to say that in a negative way. He has put forth this idea of the China dream in which every individual within China should be able to live up to their full potential. Now, I, I've watched a lot of these propaganda films for the China dream, and maybe as an American we look at those and we think, oh, those are kind of kitschy. I mean, even with the military propaganda videos of like men lifting weights on the aircraft carrier, like that's kind of strange. But then whenever I'm doing my military training, I see all these propaganda videos and I, you know, I'm like tearing up and I'm like, America's so great, right? Same thing. You know, people look at our videos and then they think, what is with this U.S. exceptionalism? Why do they think they deserve 
to be at the center of the world. China and Chinese leaders and their people admire how far they've come. They believe in the resurgence of China to take back its natural position. That doesn't mean that the people are fully happy with what's going on domestically. There's a lot of critiques of corruption, um, you know, income inequality, and things of that sort. How much is that influencing decision making? I think the good news in all of this, if I can offer some optimism, is I don't think nationalism is this sort of adding fuel to the fire that people think it is. Instead, the people want on the international stage for China to stand up for its interests. That doesn't mean China can't back down in the end. So reasonable people disagree on this, but I believe if there was a conflict with Japan, for example, even if China did not come out the winner, the Chinese people would be happy that, that China stood up for itself for the first time, even if it didn't win. So I don't think nationalism ties Chinese leaders' hands. They sometimes say it does to their own benefit, um, but I don't find a lot of evidence to suggest that. Thank you. Um, I'll ask one more question of the panel and then open it up for, for questions from the audience. Um, I think I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, the issue of cybersecurity, which we've talked about in several other panels today. Um, Though the focus has recently been on North Korea's capabilities, um, it was less than a year ago that the Justice Department indicted five PLA officers uh, with uh, cyber espionage. Um, so I'm wondering, I want to ask of the panel, how should the, the US prepare itself for this, especially from China? <laughs> well, the problem is that there doesn't seem to be a dialogue going on. I mean, they, officially there, there was one, but I, I don't believe um, the conversation is, is, is being continued. And um, um, one more time, I mean, if, if the, um, the business conversations were to be uh, expanded, that may, that may help to have a cyber di dialogue as well. But on the security aspect, I don't, I don't I'm not sure really if we can achieve a, 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 a regular conversation between the U.S. and the, and the Chinese military on this, or the, you know, authorities. I think there is an asymmetrical relationship when it comes to the Ill Ill illicit use of cyber capabilities. That is, China wants a lot from us. We don't want very much from China. <laughs> And if you look at, for example, what China's doing with a fifth generation combat aircraft, it looks amazingly like, at least what I've seen, the F-35. I mean, clearly, we've been hacked like crazy for that. Uh, what can we do? Well, we can simply increase our own defensive capabilities, cyber defense, mm -hmm. but I don't think we want to engage in a cyber war with China. I, I don't think that's in the cards. I just want to note that I don't think we're doing ourselves any favors in terms of uh, confusing and we, confusing cyber-enabled espionage for military purposes versus those that are impacting private corporations in the commercial sector of the United States. I know that people in government has worked very hard to differentiate this, particularly the United States does not engage in espionage in which we gain information on the commercial side and then give it to American companies for an advantage. And China has sort of won out on this debate by confusing people about what cyber is being used for. Can we stop the Chinese from you know, hacking? It would be great if I could go to China and bring my laptop. Probably never going to happen. We just have to be smart about it. But can we try to convince them that it's bad for their economic interests to be selling commercial information you know, to their companies to gain the advantage? I think that's where the focus needs to be. And since there's less hope on the security side, I think we need to focus on protecting our companies first. Thanks so much. Any questions from the audience? Sure. Good afternoon, Ben Hernandez, Naval History and Heritage Command. My question is about perceptions. Do the Chinese view this cyber theft as an offensive action uh, or a defensive action? Are they trying to arm themselves against us militarily? Is this unrestricted warfare or is this purely economic? Is it somewhere in between? I think the short answer is that they would see it as defensive. 
The caveat to that is they have this cult of the defensive in Chinese strategic writings in which they would say that China will ne never take a move first, offensive move first. However, anything another country does that hurts Chinese interests is considered a first move, and therefore, by the very definition, everything China does is defensive. So that doesn't really help us at all as strategists. Um, be and the second thing is that I think they think it's defensive largely because they are in the inferior position. In Chinese writings, they find the United States threatening. right? I always say they, they write about being encircled, and we think that's crazy, but you put up a map of China and you show where all the US bases and operations are. They feel vulnerable because we're there. And so they largely believe that most of their military modernization is natural given you know, their rise and designed to defend against what would be considered you know, disruptive policies on behalf of a country like the United States. Thanks, anyone else? Yep, go ahead. It, so far as looking at your uh, uh, assessments and risk assessments for uh, future conflict in, in Asia, uh, how would you view the, the uh, activities now of, of India to basically enhance its capabilities uh, in the uh, Indian Ocean, uh, the building of new bases uh, and uh, new, cap new uh, military capabilities, as well as the potential uh, remilitarization, if you will, or, uh, of Japan? Uh, in response to some of the activities in both North Korea and China uh, that we see uh, the uh, Prime Minister Abe trying to uh, promote. Uh, how would that affect your, your, your risk assessment of future conflicts there? Well, <clears throat> India for some time now has had a look east policy, which the U.S. endorses. India has had very close relations with Vietnam in terms of oil exploration in areas that China claims and then obviously Vietnam claims as well. India is now providing Vietnam with certain military assistance, including uh, the uh, uh, training of Sukhoi pilots. Uh, so India sees itself, I think, as very much involved in Southeast Asian security as an extension of its Look East policy. Uh, Japan is talking about the, po well, the United States is talking about Japan beginning South China Sea patrols. Uh, I think it was Admiral Greenert who said, gee, we would, we would welcome that. Uh, I think Prime, Prime Minister Abe would agree, but he's not said so publicly yet. It's still a sensitive issue internally in Japanese politics. There's, to me, it seems like in that question there is also a statement about Chinese behavior potentially has these negative effects for China's security environment. It's possible that given their more aggressive stance on territorial issues, this could lead to Japanese remilitarization, perhaps a more aggressive stance on their border with India. It seems to me that the Chinese suffer from an opposite bias that the United States suffers from. We think that all countries are responding to us. China thinks that no one is ever responding to their policy. So if you look at Chinese writings about it, they understand that remilitarization is possible. They see what the Indians are doing. But they'll either say that you know, that's not a response to them or that that is a response to China's rise, the nature of trends and structural change, not their behavior. So even though we see a lot of these things happening, I don't think China is going to change its position. Um, and I think at least on the China-India uh, Nexus, it's very important to know that the Chinese view of India is very different than India of China. I did field work in India, and I was surprised with how often they would bring up the 1962 war. I went to China, went to the biggest bookstore in Beijing, so I was doing field work on the topic for a book, asked for their books on the Sino-Indian War, and the response was, we fought a war against India. Right, so the Chinese, I don't think, are quite as focused on that border issue as the Indians are. Thanks so much. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but if you would all join me in giving a hand to our panel. Thank you.